let's get started so we were talking about local and global minima in the minimum in the previous uh, lecture and today we uh, we're going to talk about optimality conditions so necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality and then we'll look at an example where uh, some of the things we are talk we are talking about today uh, how we can apply it in a on a problem and we can deduce some uh, uh, some important uh, conclusions. <coughs> so everyone remembers what global and local minimum is, right? So we all remember the definitions. The definitions were, uh, were mentioned in the previous lecture. So I'm going to write it very quickly, uh, but that's just for us to uh, recall. So X star Local minimum implies that f of x star is less than f of x for every x that is within epsilon ball of x star. And x star global minimum if f of x star is less than or equal to f of x for all x in Rn. <clears throat> so one of the things that we are going to talk about first is necessary conditions for optimality. So necessary condition means that if x star is a local minimum, what exactly is a condition that x star must satisfy for it to be a local minimum? <coughs> okay. So if the condition is not satisfied, then x star is certainly not a local minimum. So here is the first uh, first order necessary condition. So if x star is a local minimum, then first order necessary condition gradient of f at x star is equal to 0. Second order necessary condition, second derivative of f at x star is greater than or equal to 0. So this is the notation for positive semi-definite. So this is first order necessary condition, second order necessary condition. So the first order is the first derivative of the function vanishes. The second order is that if you took, take the second derivative of the function, evaluate it at x star, then it must be a positive semi-definite matrix. Yes. Sorry? Second derivative. So remember, we were computing second derivative of the functions. Go back to the notes a couple of lectures back. So when you take the second derivative of the function f and x star is a vector, then this is a matrix. It's a square symmetric matrix. Okay. It was covered, I think, three, three or so lectures ago. Okay, so let's look at why these conditions should be true. So we are, we are assuming that x star is a local minimum and the conclusion is that the first derivative should be zero, the second derivative should be a positive semi-definite matrix. So we need to start from this condition and then we need to derive these two uh, conclusions from that particular condition. So let's pick uh, D as a vector 
and let alpha be a very small number, but it still has to be positive number. And I pick f of x star plus alpha d minus f of x star. What is this supposed to be? So I'm standing at x star and I take a small step of magnitude alpha in the direction d. What does this say? If I'm taking a small step alpha in the direction d, right? So f of x star is less than or equal to f of x. So this is my x, this is my x star, so this must be non-negative. Okay, so I'm standing at x star, I take a small step in the direction d, and the step is uh, va of value f alpha. Alpha is greater than zero, but it's a very, very small quantity. So this can be made within this ball by picking a very small value of alpha. Any question? What does this, what is this equal to? Remember Taylor series? So this is gradient of f at x star transpose d plus small o of alpha. So small o of alpha means these are higher order terms in alpha. So alpha square, alpha cube, alpha raised to 4, and so on. So that's small o of alpha. And this is greater than or equal to 0. Can I divide it by alpha? Okay, so alpha is strictly positive. I'm going to divide this term by a positive number. So I'll still retain the inequality here. So I'm going to divide it by alpha. And I'm going to call that this is also non-negative. So what do I get? I get gradient of fx star transpose d plus small o of alpha over alpha is greater than or equal to 0. So at least until here, everything is straightforward. I've only done basic manipulations. How do I go from here to this particular conclusion, the first order necessary condition? Can the small o of alpha over alpha be simplified to a constant? Does that, does that work or is that not right? If it is constant, then it must be, I don't know, it can be positive or negative. So what will you do with that? If it is a constant, technically this is not a constant. This is something that goes to zero as alpha goes to zero. So you can't assume that it is a constant because it is actually not a constant as a function of alpha. What can we do? So remember this statement, all of these statements holds for any d and alpha is strictly positive, but alpha can be as small as we want. So whenever I say as small as we want, it means that we are going to take a limit alpha going to zero. Right? So I'm going to take the limit alpha going to zero. There is nothing here. This is not a function of alpha. This is not a function of alpha. And this term goes to zero as alpha goes to zero. So what I get is <coughs> I 
I am going to take the limit alpha goes to 0. Okay, so I at least arrived at this particular conclusion that the gradient of f of x star transpose d has to be non-negative and this has to be true for every d in Rn. Okay, because remember by taking alpha going to 0 I have eliminated alpha from the equation but d is still hanging around doing nothing so far. So what is a vector that if you take the inner product with any other vector you get a non-negative value, zero, right? So if it was a non-zero vector, I can take d to be the negative of the non-zero vector and I'll get a positive value. Well, uh, yeah, neg then I'll get a negative value. So if this was non-negative, I can pick d to be, sorry, if, so what I'm claiming is this implies that this is equal to zero. And if it was non-zero, then I can pick D to be negative of this, and I get a negative number, so it will not be satisfied. This condition will not be satisfied. Okay, uh, is the argument clear? In zero, so how can we get this magnitude more than zero? Uh, you, you are not, this is non-negative, right? So it can be zero as well. It's just a? I think this is just can be zero, because uh, this one is just can be zero. Correct, correct. So, so, so this has to be true for all D in Rn. Because remember, I picked an arbitrary D here, and all of these statements are true for all D in Rn. So if this statement has to be true for all D in Rn, then it must be that the gradient of F is equal to zero. Because otherwise, we cannot have this statement for all D in Rn. So this, uh, what we get is the first order necessary condition for optimality. So the first derivative of the function at a local minimum must be zero. And if you recall from the previous lecture, we had, uh, we had drawn a function f, and if you go and look at the photos of like the, the points of local minimum, all of the derivatives are equal to zero in that particular picture. Yes. Uh, I understand why you said that when you uh, replace the gradient of whatever x star equal to zero in the equation above, mm -hmm. you always get zero. Yeah, you will always get zero. So this condition will always be satisfied. Okay, but it wouldn't ever be greater than it will always be zero. It'll always be zero. That's okay. Right? Because here the statement is non negative, non negative. So here, the gradient must be equal to zero. Only then this statement will be satisfied. So if I say the gradient is greater than or equal to zero, right. will the equation above still be satisfied? No, because what does it mean for a vector to be greater than or equal to zero? All the elements being non-negative? Uh, if all the elements are non-negative, I can pick a D which is negative of all those non-negative elements and I get something which is strictly less than zero, right? Because D has to be, D can be any vector in Rn, so I, I, I get to choose pick, I get to choose uh, whatever D I want to pick in this statement. Is this why you mentioned you want positive definite instead of semi-definite matrices? Sorry? Earlier in one of the other lectures, you had mentioned we want positive definite instead of positive. Uh, we'll get to it in a bit. But that's not, that's a vector, that's not a matrix. The first derivative is a vector. Okay. The second derivative is a matrix. So that's what I've written here. So I want the second derivative to be positive semi-definite here. And then I'll get to the positive definite part in a bit. Any questions so far on this statement? The first order necessary condition for optimality? Because now we'll move on to the second, second uh, order necessary condition. Okay, so I'm going to keep these equations. I'm going to make similar, uh, similar argument. 
for the second order necessary condition as well. So I'm going to erase this side and I'm going to erase this side. So I start with the same expression. I have, I take the first order Taylor series and I have gradient of fx star transpose d alpha square over 2 What is this term equal to? What is this term equal to? Zero. zero. We just proved that this is equal to zero. So I have the same thing and I'm going to divide the whole thing by alpha square. So I get d transpose second derivative of the function d plus small o of alpha square over alpha square is non-negative. And this has to hold for all d in Rn and this has to hold for all alpha greater than zero, sufficiently small. What's the next obvious step? Take the limit alpha going to zero. This term is going to vanish. So it, it holds for all alpha. So I can take the limit alpha goes to zero. This term is going to vanish. All I'm going to be left with is this term. So I'll just write it here. So this has to be true for all d in Rn. When will that be true? Yeah, when the second derivative is positive semi-definite. Remember the second derivative is always symmetric, right? So we did a bunch of examples uh, earlier and we showed that the second derivative of the function f is always symmetric. So I have a symmetric matrix here. I'm going to pre-multiply it by d transpose. I'm going to multiply it by d. And d is an arbitrary vector. So I pick an arbitrary vector. I compute this expression. It has to be non-negative. This is a symmetric matrix. It can only happen if, d, if this matrix is a positive semi-definite matrix. So that gives me the second order necessary condition for optimality. Okay. So second derivative of f has to be positive semi-definite. Any questions so far? So the first order and second order necessary condition for optimality. So because it's a necessary condition, we start with the hypothesis that this is a local minimum. And we arrive at these two conclusions. And the important thing to note here is if these conclusions are false, so I give you a point x and the first derivative of the function is non-zero or the second derivative of the function is, uh, has some negative eigenvalues, then you know for sure that x star is not a local minimum, right? But just because these two conditions are satisfied, you can't really conclude that x star is a local minimum. So, Remember, A implies B means not B implies not A. So if these conditions are violated, then it means that X star is not a local minimum. Let's look at an example to make it clear. I'm going to erase this side. Everyone has noted it down. Perfect.
f of x1 x2 x2 minus x1 square x2 minus 3 x1 square and let me put so let's claim that 0 0 is a local minimum let's try to refute the claim that 0 0 is a local minimum so when the function f when you pick x1 to be 0 and x2 to be 0 uh, you get a zero value because this is zero this is zero 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 so you get a zero value let's look at the first derivative of the function What is the first derivative? So in the, in the first element, I have to differentiate with respect to x1. So I get minus 2x1 minus 6x1 and then I have to take the derivative with respect to x2. What is the derivative at 0, 0? What is the derivative? Yeah. Yeah. 0, 0. So this is at x1 equals to 0, x2 equals to 0. So you would be excited to see that okay the first order necessary condition is satisfied so perhaps 0 0 is an optimal solution perhaps 0 0 is a local minimum of this function this nonlinear function now let's look at the second derivative What is the second <laughs> derivative? It's a horrible expression. Let's see. Minus 2. No, I don't want to take the. I'll write the expression directly. So this is minus 2 x1 x2 minus no plus 6 x1 cube did I do this right Okay, perfect. So I have to differentiate the first expression with respect to x1. So I have minus 8x2 plus 12 into 3. 31x1 square. And then I have to differentiate that with respect to x2. So I get minus 8x1. And then the second derivative is, uh, so here I have to differentiate with respect to x1, so I get minus 8x1. And I differentiate with respect to x2, and I get 2. So at 0, 0, what does this matrix give me? I have 0, 0, 0. I hope everything is correct. Um, that first term, 36 x1 squared. 
so I have six x1 cubes, six x1 cubes, so that's 12 x1 cube. And if I differentiate with respect to x1, I get 12 multiplied by three x1 square. So that gets me 36 x1 square. So are these two conditions satisfied? So looks like x1 and x2 equals to zero is an optimal solution, is a local minimum. The answer is of course no, right? So if, if zero, zero was a local minimum, then these two conditions are satisfied. But because these two conditions are satisfied, doesn't imply that x star is a local minimum. So that's the counter example here. So how do I prove that 0, 0 is not a local minimum here? How do I prove that 0, 0 is not a local minimum? So let me pick x to be, x1 to be 0 point, let me pick carefully, yeah, I'll pick x1 to be 0 0.01 and x2 to be 2 x1 square. So I'm going to pick x1 to be a small number. Well, technically I can pick x2 to be 2x1 square and I'll still be fine. So if that is the case, what is f of x1, x2? I have 2x1 square minus x1 square. And then I have 2x1 square minus 3x1 square. So this gets multiplied to minus x1 square. So I get minus x1 raised to 4. Is this a negative number? Right, so it's strictly lower than, this one is strictly lower than f of 0, 0. Okay, so I've constructed a point, x1 which is close to 0. I can pick I can pick x1 to be as close to 0 as I want. And x2 to be 2x1 square. So 2 is in between 1 and 3, OK? So I picked a point between 1 and 3. So I picked 2. And then I showed you that the function evaluated at this point is actually minus x1 raised to 4, which is strictly negative, strictly below f of 0, 0. So what this essentially means is just because these conditions are satisfied doesn't really imply that x1 is a, x star is a local minimum. But if x star were a local minimum, then these conditions must be satisfied, okay? So if it was negative two, if it was negative two, I can straight away rule out that x star is a local minimum. Because it's a negative, there is one eigenvalue which is negative. So it's not a positive semi-definite matrix. But because the, sec the, the, the eigenvalue here is 0 and 2, it is a positive semi-definite matrix. But I still cannot conclude that x star is a local minimum. Any question? Can you repeat yeah. that? Sorry? Can you repeat that? So what I'm saying is, if x star is a local minimum, then these two conditions are satisfied. If these conditions were not satisfied, I can straight away say that x star is not a local minimum. What that means is if this were minus two here, then I know that it's not positive semi-definite, and then I could have said that x star is not a local minimum straight away, because these conditions are not satisfied. But if these conditions are satisfied, which is the case, I really cannot conclude that x star is a local minimum. I cannot, 
I cannot conclude. So let's look at a condition which is called sufficient condition when we can conclude that x star is a local minimum. So if the sufficient conditions are satisfied, then x star is a local minimum. So let's look at what sufficient condition says. Any, any further question before I raise the board? Yeah. Yes. Um, <coughs> for this case where we have both the gradient and the second derivative, for the second derivative, that, that not zero, right? That's non-zero. So this condition is not satisfied? Sat sat no, but both eigenvalues are strictly non-negative. Remember, positive semi-definite means eigenvalues have to be non-negative. So I have two eigenvalues there, 0 and 2. OK. Then the second question is, for your f of s at the right side of the board, was it got it from this first equation here? What is the? The f of s, which is a function of s1, s2, at the right side, is it the same equation as this one here? Yes. OK. Yes. So for the two ways, the fx has to be convex function, right? Yeah, we'll get to it in a bit when we talk about convex functions. Yeah. Any other question? OK. So if x bar satisfies first derivative is equal to 0, second derivative is positive definite, so the second derivative has to be a positive definite matrix. This implies that x bar is a local minimum. This is known as sufficient condition. So if these two conditions are satisfied, then x bar is certainly 100%. It's certainly a local minimum without any dispute. And as you can see, it's the positive definite condition that is violated in this example. What is that equal to? Can I simplify that expression more, given the conditions that are satisfied by x bar? What happens to this term? It's 0, because the first derivative of f is equal to 0. This term goes to 0. What about this term? 
So remember that the second derivative of f is positive definite. Okay. So I can do a little bit of massaging. So I'm going to claim that this is greater than equal to alpha square half d transpose let me let me make it equal for now What is this term going to be equal to? Uh, well, let me say, let's lambda min. OK, let me write it here. So remember that the second derivative of f is a positive definite matrix. So it must have a minimum eigenvalue lambda min. And that lambda min has to be strictly positive. This one is must be greater than 0. So that would yield here half lambda min norm of d square Okay, everyone understands how we got from here to here? That's just the property of a positive definite matrix. So D transpose a positive definite matrix, let me call this Q, D is greater than or equal to lambda min of Q norm of D square. So this statement holds for every positive definite matrix, where I can pick the minimum eigenvalue of the positive definite matrix multiplied by the norm of d square. And this term is always going to be greater than or equal to this particular expression. There are uh, easy ways to prove it using simple linear algebra. So you can take a orthonormal decomposition of D and then replace all the, uh, all the eigenvalues with the minimum eigenvalue and then that's how you get this particular expression. So I'm not doing it here, but uh, it's something you can try at home. So Q has, Q has N eigenvectors. You can do the orthonormal decomposition of D with respect to those eigenvectors. Collect all the terms, you will get this inequality fairly easily. So that's what I've used here. Okay, so alpha square is positive, d square is positive, this is positive. This is the term that's going to zero as I pick alpha very, very small. So I can pick a very small alpha, and this term is always going to be positive, this term is always going to be positive, and this term is close to zero, which means that this whole expression is always going to be greater than zero, right? For alpha sufficiently small. Does that make sense? Because when alpha is very small, this term is close to zero, this term is positive, this term is positive, so this entire term is going to be strictly positive. 
So what I proved was, if I am standing at x bar, I take a small step in the direction d, and d is any arbitrary, uh, arbitrary direction, okay? And then I subtract it from f of x bar, then it's strictly positive. This means that f of x bar plus alpha d is greater than f of x bar for alpha sufficiently small. And that's why x bar is a local minimum. So this allows us, this condition allows us to certify that x bar is a local minimum. Otherwise, there is no other way to certify that x bar is a local minimum in the general case. How many of you have trained machine learning models before in undergraduate or in some other coursework? Okay. So whenever you are training a machine learning model, you are essentially trying to solve a minimization problem, but we never check for the second order condition for optimality. So we say that the model is trained just by looking at the first derivative because computing the second derivative is very difficult. So certifying whether you have reached a global minimum or not or a local minimum or not in many problems is very difficult because you cannot really compute the second derivative of the matrix, let alone proving that it is a positive definite matrix. Okay. So something to keep in mind, uh, that's not the end of the world. Maybe you are not able to prove that x bar is a local minimum, but if, it, but if it does the job, then it does the job. It's good enough. However, know that until you check for this positive definite condition, you don't really know whether x bar is a local minimum. And we saw an example where this term was positive semi-definite and x bar was not a local minimum. Any question? All is not bleak. If we make uh, some more assumptions, if we strengthen the assumption of the function f, then we can prove a much stronger uh, result. So let's try to do that before I raise everything on the board. This is the last chance to ask questions on this topic. OK. So one of the major results in the theory of optimization is so if function f is convex then x star is a global minimum if and only if gradient of f of x star is equal to 0. How do we prove that result? So we remember from the property of convex function, f of x star plus d minus f of x star is greater than or equal to So this is because f is a convex function. So this is some one of the one of the ways by which convex functions are defined. So if f is convex, then this equation must hold true for all d. This has to be true for all d.
so if f of if the gradient is equal to 0 so if then f of x star plus d minus f of x star is strictly non negative The other way, if x star is a local minimum, then this implies that gradient of f x star is equal to 0. The one important difference in the case of convex function is that if x star is a local minimum, then it's also a global minimum. Okay? So let's try to prove that particular part. So this part comes from the first order necessary condition, right? This one we just proved, this particular part. So first order necessary condition says, if x star is a local minimum, then gradient of f x star must be equal to zero. So the next statement that I want to prove is that if x star is a local minimum, then it's also a global minimum. So let's prove it by contradiction. So here is the contradiction. So let's say x star is a local minimum and y is the global minimum and x star and y are not the same. So let x star local minimum, y is a global minimum and x star is not equal to y. What can go wrong? Let's try to find out what can go wrong. So I pick an alpha. I'm going to pick, uh, where should I write it? Maybe I'll write it there. So I'm going to pick alpha to be between 0 and 1. And I have f of alpha x star plus 1 minus alpha y. What is this equal to? Because f is convex. Is there a problem there? What is the problem? So I'm assuming x star is a local minimum, y is a global minimum, x star is not equal to y. 
and f of x star is greater than f of y. That's what it means, right? So it's not a global minimum, it's a local minimum, so the value at x star must be greater than f of y. If this is the case, then I have something which is greater than f of y. So f of y is supposed to be the global minimum, so it has to have the absolute minimum value. So this is the absolute minimum value, and this is something above the minimum value. So this is less than f of x star. So this is a higher value and this is a lower value. So this must be, the convex combination must be less than the higher value. And this is true for every alpha in 0 and 1. This is true for every alpha in 0 and 1. So I'm standing at x star. I have another point y which is a global minimum. And as I travel along this line, as I'm traveling along this line, I find that the value is strictly less than f of x star, okay? So as I'm traveling along this line, the value of the function is becoming lower and lower, which means this is not a local minimum, which means that x star is not a local minimum because I'm able to find a path from x star in a specific direction where the function value reduces. So it must not be a, x star is not a local minimum. So this leads to a contradiction because we started with the assumption that x star is a local minimum. So the, the, our assumption must be, our hypothesis must be wrong. And what we get is x star is also a global minimum. So it's a global minimum, this is a global minimum. Uh, and therefore every local minimum is a global minimum in a convex function. And the way to remember this is as follows. This is a convex function, and all of these points are global minimum, okay? You don't have a local minimum in a convex function. Any point that is a minimum must be a global minimum. So that's pretty much it for today's class. Any questions so far? We have about one minute before we disperse. Can you go by that last part? This one? Okay. So I assumed x star is a local minimum. I assumed y is a global minimum. I assumed f of x star is strictly greater than f of y, which means that x star is not a global minimum. I pick an alpha which is between 0 and 1. So I'm going to travel along this particular line. I'm going to go from x star towards y. And what I notice is that the function value is strictly less than f of x star which means that x star is not a local minimum because I'm able to find a direction along which the value of the function is decreasing. Remember this function value is the function value along that line and that seems to be lower than f of x star. For every alpha, this is true for all alpha in 0, 1, okay? So that's why x star is not a local minimum because we are arriving at a contradiction based on the hypothesis that we have made. Okay, uh, any question? When alpha equals to one, then... Uh, is it, then is, is will equal to fx? Uh, right, that's why we are arriving at a contradiction. I mean, we can always make it this. We still arrive at the same contradiction. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll see you on Friday.